Paul, welcome to Slush Singapore. Thank you. It's Good fantastic morning, to finally have you at Slush Singapore. I know that you've been at Slush events elsewhere, so we're super happy to have you here. Um, many people might actually know you and, and, may, and even more have, have heard of you. Um, you know, you, you are a serial entrepreneur, you're an investor, you're an adventurer, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're a mentor to, to, many, to many companies. Um, and yeah, you're a world traveler, really. Um, so tell us, to kick us off a little bit, um, tell us, where have you been traveling in the past month yeah. and what have you been up to? Um, so last month, well, I'm here, I arrived here last night. Um, but yeah, before this, I was in San Francisco for my friend's 40th birthday. Uh, before that, I was in Barcelona for a couple of days. Uh, and I spent two weeks in Cape Town and Johannesburg. And then I forget exactly before that. But like, um, yeah, I mean, like I'm traveling around all the time because I'm just meeting with portfolio companies, talking to investors, and trying to connect people to, you know, Asia, San Francisco, Finland, etc. So my job is just to kind of be in many places at once and then also try to connect them to where I've been and where I'm going forward. Yeah, and I actually heard that you don't really have a home base. The world is your oyster, literally. This is true, yeah. I've been homeless <laughs> for a few years. Can you tell That's I another way homeless? to put it. Right, so yes, yes. I'm the most homeless person you guys know. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's talk first a little bit about Paul as an entrepreneur, right? Um, so you've started several businesses. The first one you started shortly after you graduated, um, and, and, and you know some of them you've exited and, and, and you've done really well. Um, you know, a lot of the times people say there are different reasons for starting, starting companies. Um, you know, you have an idea, you have a passion, you see a need, something's missing from the market. What was it for you? Why did you start, say, your first company? What was that push? Yeah, I mean, my story is not so, it's not like you wake up one day like, I want to start a company, right? It's like, no, I mean, I grew up, you know, child of the 80s, played a lot of video games, especially Nintendo and Sega, and I fell in love with video games. And you're like, okay cool, so how do I make video games? And so I taught myself how to program a little bit, did some art, you know, pixel graphics, stuff like that. And then, yeah, like, I just knew at, like, age 15, like, oh, shit, this is what I want to do. I want to make video games. And I wasn't thinking about building a company. It's just like, I want to make some cool product. And then the best way to make that product happen was to build a company, right? So How oh, old were you when you when I you was did? 21 when I started the company, but I was already kind of tooling around doing stuff since, like, you know, age 17, 18. But, like, you're like, okay, I want to make this cool product. Like, how do I have what's in my head and build it, right? And then you're like, oh shit, the easiest way to do that is to build a company. So I have to hire people, I have to incorporate, I have to do all these things because my goal was to get a game onto the shelves, right? This is like, you know, cartridges and old shit like that. Like, so yeah, it's like, th the way to do that was to start a company. It wasn't like, oh, I want to start a company for the sake of starting a company. Yeah. No, you build a company because it was a way to kind of bring what you want to do into your life or like how to manifest this thing. So. Yeah. Uh, becoming an entrepreneur was accidental. It wasn't like a plan. It was just to go out there and make yeah. cool shit. That's it. And it wasn't even cool back in the days to, to be an entrepreneur, as cool as it is today, right? Like, it, there wasn't a lot of that hype that no. we see today. No, I mean, 20 years ago, I mean, no. You build a company because it was interesting, but, like, it wasn't like you could tell your friends, like, I'm starting a company. I'm being, the word entrepreneur did not, was not anybody's vocabulary. You're just like, no, I'm going to do something, right? And most people are like, you fucking crazy. Go get a job. And you're, dude, I remember I told my mom, she was like crying. Oh, my God, my son is going to be a failure. Oh, yeah. So, no, like, you just go out there and do it. So, no, there wasn't a thing. And I'm happy it's a thing now. This is fucking great. You see all these people, like, they all want to do this. So, I think that's really, really amazing. Fantastic. Well, and, and then after the first one, you, you, you went on to start other companies and so on. So you're really like a serial entrepreneur. Well, when people normally t talk about starting a business, they say, yeah, you know what? You put all of it in and you just go with that one idea. You believe in it and you go and you follow through. And so in a sense, when you think about serial entrepreneurs, I suppose you become serial entrepreneur by either exiting one or failing. So what's, what, what's the story with you? How, how, how many of each have you had and, and what have you learned yeah, maybe from those? So I started three companies. The first one, the game company, was actually a pretty big success. And so after that company, I thought I was God. I go, like, holy shit, I did you know, great games, sold millions of copies. Like, you're super confident, right? But my second company was a complete failure, right? And like, yeah, I lost all my investors' money. I lost all my money. That really sucked too. My mom actually didn't, was like, oh, you are bankrupt now, right? Um, yeah, but you just keep on going at it. And, like, no, once again, it's like, you want to do something, you want to get people interesting around you, and you make sacrifices. But, like, even though that second company is a failure, I actually learned the most in that one, right? Because I got my ass handed to me. My first company, everything I touched did really well. I, was, I, I said I became cocky, and you're like, oh, shit, this is too easy, right? 
I didn't think it was too easy. You just, it, it, in retrospect, it's too easy. But yeah, like now it's like, oh shit, the company where I failed is actually where I learned the most. It actually where I learned to empathize the most with other entrepreneurs and kind of connect with people. And also I built all my relationships. Like I remember I had friends that went and started a company at the same time, right? And some of those guys did amazingly well. They raised money from like two or three VCs and they did psh, rocket ship and they never met anybody. I sucked really bad and I had to talk to hundreds of investors and they all said no, but I actually, those people became my connections later. And it was a super valuable resource in the long term. But yeah, so sometimes you win, sometimes you fail, and then you just keep on at it. And then, yeah, hopefully you pull it off and do a really big success in the long term. Yeah. Exactly. There's also always a little bit of luck involved. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, but, uh, but luck is huge. <laughs> luck is still huge. Like, you never know, right? Sometimes you have somebody sitting next to you and working a similar thing, and they do a little bit better, of course, but they still get lucky too. And you're like, fuck. Sometimes you come to slosh, you meet a person, you never know, you know? You so, never know, right? exactly. All right, well, hey, let's talk a little bit more about then the other side, right? So you've also started um, after you've, you know, successfully started different businesses and you've, you've started um, several funds. So you have, you had one in, in San Francisco and then you ventured out in a sense and there were very interesting places where you started the funds, right? So you have one in Eastern Europe, more on the gaming. You have one in Africa, yeah. Savannah Fund. And then one in Southeast Asia that many of you might know, uh, Golden Gate Ventures, a very successful um, early stage VC fund. Um, so tell us a little bit about how did you choose, like how did you choose to go to this market? Why? Like yeah. Southeast Asia, you know, um, Africa? I mean, there's a couple things. Um, one, so my first companies, my first and my third company had a very international team. So I had people in the United States, but I had people in Netherlands, Poland, you know, Ukraine. And I was doing a lot of work in Japan and Asia. And I was like, okay, so like, I really liked the international exposure. So I guess in my DNA, that was kind of always there. Um, but then, yeah, I started my first, I mean, my, my first fund was like, it was accidental once again, too. It wasn't a plan. It's not like I wake up one day, I want to become a VC. No, I fucking hate most VCs, right? And like, I probably hate myself sometimes. Like, okay, but like, you, I was like, you know, just starting to do some small investments. Like, okay, cool, some $25,000, $50,000 checks here and there. And then like, this is awesome. I want to do this. This should be my next big thing, right? Um, I teamed up with a few of my friends, and we st started a thing called IO Ventures. It was the first accelerator in San Francisco, right? So Y Combinator started in Boston, Techstars started in Colorado, and we started in San Francisco. And so we started investing just our own money, never raised outside money, just our personal money. And yeah, we did it together, a few of my friends, and we're like, this is awesome, right? And then it became a progress. So, and then in doing that, I started, people kind of started coming through my door and saying, hey, would you invest in us? And I was like, oh, well, you're not from San Francisco. I don't know if we can, but like I started meeting amazing, amazing people, and I'm like, maybe I could help here, right? And so we started doing some small investments in the United States to international companies moving to the United States. And then shortly I was like, well, why don't we go outside? And um, actually our first landing point was Singapore. And so um, the Singapore government actually approached me a bunch of times saying, hey, would you guys be willing to come out and do something in S Singapore? And at first I was like, no, we're focused only on San Francisco. We have no plans of going internationally. Um, but then my co-founder, Vinny, from Golden Gate Ventures, um, he had just finished about a year traveling. We started two companies together, right? So after we started our last company, he was traveling for about a year in the region. He's like, Paul, I want to do something here. I'm like, dude, I've been talking to the government. Do you want to talk to them? And the rest is history. And then after the amazing work that Vinny's done here with Golden Gate, um, and then the work we did in San Francisco, I was like, why don't we do this in other parts of the world? Like, I was like, hey, there's an opportunity here. And like, there's so many super smart, super cool people that were missing two things. One, they were missing access to capital. Okay, cool, we could do that. But even more so, they were missing access to people who've done it before. Like when I started my first company, I could knock on a door of some guy or girl who's started a company, you know, 10 or 20 years before me, and they'll take me for coffee, and they're like, don't do that shit, don't do that. Oh, that's awesome, do that. And like, you meet a really cool entrepreneur, let's say in Singapore eight years ago, or in Africa, and you like close your eyes and you like talk to them. They're, they have the same problems you do. It's just they didn't have anybody to talk it through with. So we're like, oh, I can fix that. I could show up on a plane, I could go out and put resources in, and that's kind of the end result. Yeah, it's amazing to hear that. It's it's just so much more about just giving money. It's also giving other resources support that the startups need. Yeah. And like you pointed out, if you've been there yourself, you really know how they're feeling. You yeah. know what they need. You know how to mentor them or, or coach them or give them some advice uh, in addition to the capital. Yeah, I mean, you try to give it. First and foremost, okay, you put the money in, that's huge, whatever. But like. You have to just be a fan, right? Like when I get involved in the company, it's like I want to be your number one fan, right? And so, number one fan doesn't mean I'm always going to be cheering for you. I want to beat you up, kind of like your favorite band. You're like, I fucking love that album, or like, oh yeah, this is good. I still believe in you, but like, uh, you, that wasn't your best stuff, right? So you want to kind of go out there and engage with the entrepreneur, 
get excited with them, share their highs, share their lows, and like support them. And then whenever you can, help out. But also, you have to know when to get the hell out of the way too. Like, hey, like, I don't want to be on top of somebody. Like, I don't want to be bugging them all the time because they may be like, dude, I don't need your help now. Or like, or sometimes I don't know what I'm doing in that space, but maybe I think I am. And they're like, no, I got but this. But is that right? tough or do you think that it's like you, you, have, you have figured it pretty well out or like, I've do any better. of the founders are ever like, yeah, Come on. I'd say I've gotten better at it, right? So the beginning, you know, having, when I first started my company, you know, just after selling my last company, I went into investing, I wanted to touch it more. You're like, oh, I could do this. Or like, I could do this awesome, just move out of the way. And then you're like, no, you're like not helping the person. The person's not growing. And actually, you might be actually being destructive. So you want to be helpful. You want to give advice occasionally. But you also want to let the entrepreneurs to pull on you, not so you push yourself on top, on top of that person. So um, yeah, I've gotten better at not being people's faces. Um, but yeah, sometimes you need to, but most of the time you should just be supportive, cheer them on, make some introductions here and there, put resources around the person, but never force yourself. But that's the worst thing you could do. Yeah. Cool. Well, when, when you've worked with um, and you've seen so many companies in, in Southeast Asia, and obviously given that we're in Singapore, um, what are some of the, when you look at the founders here, what are some of the similarities or differences that you see, for example, from the States? Yeah. And, and what are some of the things why you believe so much in this particular region, right? Like, is there something about the founders? Is there something about the ideas that really gives you, uh, and of course, you know, Golden Gate Ventures has done really well here. So, so what do you think it is about this region or these particular startups that stand out? Um, I think people here were just, were ready to listen. So we came here, people were eager and excited, right? That's just another thing that was really cool about Finland. People wanted to learn and were like open their hearts and say, hey. So like I remember we came and like, you know, some countries you go there and they're kind of like, eh, we don't need you, right? Here they're like, no, we want to engage and we want to listen, right? And that was amazing. So it made us feel comfortable to come here. Um, I think that's one really important thing. Two, I mean, people here are super fucking smart, right? And so super smart, but maybe they weren't necessarily um, as aggressive or a little bit shy. And so we have to fucking kick them a little bit. You're like, come on, do the shit, right? And I've seen that just by kind of giving a gentle push, people Help excel. Help them realize their full potential. Something like that. Or you have to kick their ass a little bit, right? And like, but like once people get started, they do really well. And so we felt just kind of giving some people a little bit of nudge really helped. And now it's a snowball effect, right? And like, so other founders here helping. And now there's like, you know, a generation of two of entrepreneurs that have started companies. Some even have exits here. And now they're kind of, they don't need us as much. But like, yeah, like that was the initial kind of push. And now you see amazing things. So, um, but yeah, this region, like I said, super well educated, uh, super opening and will willing to listen, which is amazing. Um, and then yeah, like a great, you know, region. It's like so much opportunity too. In that, like, it's not necessarily you know what they say, red ocean. It's not like taking over right here. Like, I want to build this company. Holy shit, it's, there's, a, there's a gap. I could go out there and do that. So that's really amazing. We could come in and not be as, um, I guess, face as much competition. So that's cool. Well, why do you think that people still, though, then with all this talent and all these opportunities and all these amazing people, um, why do you think that, that there's still one Silicon Valley that everybody looks at and says, oh, that's the, that's the promised land. Like everybody wants to be the Silicon Valley of yeah. name a country, a city, right? Yeah. So, so why do you think that is? And, and is that just a bit of a reputation that isn't there anymore? Or is there something profoundly different about the Bay Area, that you don't have the places... No, I mean, the like Bay Area is super legit, and, like, everything that's true about it's true, right? I mean, like, the density of smart people from all around the world, 100%. But thing is, why is it Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley? It's just been around longer, right? I mean, they started the first, you know, tech companies in the 50s and 60s. I mean, that's happened to be where they invented the fucking silicon, fucking, you know, transistor, all this shit, right? So it just had many more years at it, right? Um... That being said, there's other places in the world that are catching up. China's done a really amazing job. You see places like Israel, even your home country, Finland's catching up quickly, right? Or the Nordics in general. So, like, Silicon Valley will be on top, I think, for many more years. But there's a lot more, I guess, diversity all around the world, right? And so, yeah. And it's thing, it's not only, like... Silicon Valley for tech, but there's other industries in different countries, right? You go to L.A., it's Hollywood, right? You go to Paris, New York, Milan, it's fashion, right? So certain cities around the world are magnets for their respective industries. We just happen to be the magnet for technology, and technology happens to be the biggest thing in the world right now, and seven, you know, ten biggest companies in the world are tech. So it just happens to be it's having its moment. In 50 years, somebody will, I don't know, invent some crazy bionic, you know, who fucking knows what in the middle of Kazakhstan, and Kazakhstan becomes the next place. So, um, yes, yeah, so Silicon Valley is what it is because it's been around longer, and it's attracted all the talent, and it's now this kind of snowball. Um, but that doesn't mean it that won't um, 
change going forward? Um, well, tell us a little bit more about um, kind of also maybe reflecting some of the companies that you guys work with here in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, I mean, investing is, is a numbers game essentially, and it's a risky one as well, but you've been doing really well with your funds. So what is it that you, you're doing well and, and right? Is it me? Is that the, is that the time? Okay, that's really loud and annoying. We'll fix that, okay, okay, but cool. meanwhile. Yeah, um, um, thank you. <laughs> Good, I stalled for a little bit there. Um, yeah, in terms of like what we've done well, I think you're just dealing with people that you trust. Well, we don't know them initially, but you, you think you want to trust, right? Or people that seem, you know, they have a good heart, they're working really hard, they're not going to give up, right? Um, but yeah, we get it wrong a lot, right? Certain companies were like, oh my God, it's the next big thing, and it fails. And then sometimes you get a company, you're like, I like them, they're good, but I'm not sure. And then they sometimes excel. Um, so I wouldn't say there's any one formula. Like, okay, you meet the person, you immediately know, right? But you meet a person, you're like, I have a good hunch, and I want to kind of invest in you and take that risk with you, right? And so, yeah, that's why you, it is a numbers game. You have to go out there and make, you know, 20, 30 investments and have hopefully, like, you know, three to five pay off. And, yeah, I mean, we get it wrong a lot, right? And so also we pass on amazing companies. Like I've said no to some companies, and you're like, holy shit, I messed up really badly. And sometimes you put in a company, you think they're amazing, and they fail. But then there's a second or third company as well. So I guess the key thing is you want to be as open, and you want to, like, listen, and hopefully you get some of them right. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, I think yeah. you've done better than most, so yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. But is it difficult, I mean, when you think about, I mean, not just your fund here, but also the one in Africa, Eastern Europe, and so on, is it more difficult to get that hunch if you're not really from that area, right? Like, say, you, you have your fund in, in Africa. Is it difficult to, you know, because, I mean, there are different cultures, people behave differently, there are different, you know, ways of doing business. Yeah, I mean, there is part of that, right? And so every single one of my funds... Um, I'll have one or two international team members, and I'll have local co-founders, right? So they kind of help me understand the local dynamics. They help me understand, you know, hey, that person, when they're doing that, they're kind of lying to you. Or that person, no, like, he was just nervous, and that's kind of how we express nervousness in our, you know, in our culture. So, yeah, no, I mean, you do need to, I guess, localize a little bit. But that being said, what's cool about tech is that really great entrepreneurs around the world have a similar type of DNA. And I always say things like, if I close my eyes and just listen to them, they read the same blogs, they use the same open source, they're committing on GitHub, whatever, right? And so they have like similar shared language and similar shared hopes and dreams. So for a lot of times you're like, you're one of us. We're part of this kind of weird society of, you know, nerds, entrepreneurs, designers, whatever. And so you get a lot of that. And then of course it'll be like the local flavor, but it's still, you meet an entrepreneur in the middle of, I don't know, let's say Uganda and you're like, that person. I get you. I know who you are. I understand your struggles. Okay, you have different struggles, but I understand you're kind of like, you're kind of struggles in running a company, where you're stuck, where your head is at. And yeah, it's so a lot of times the patterns are very similar. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, since you're the expert in, in starting the funds, how do you actually start one? So say, so, so, so one is okay, you've been a serial entrepreneur, you make an exit, yeah. you have some money, you start a fund. That's fantastic. Yeah. What if you haven't exited? What if you're the serial entrepreneur that has failed? Or what if you're not an entrepreneur at all? Like, how do you, where do you go and how, how do you start? If you're really passionate helping startups, investing in them, really believing and supporting, yeah. where do you start? I mean, there's a couple different paths, right? You mentioned one. Successful entrepreneur, you have your own money, you start doing some angel investing, you prove yourself on your own money, and then people are like, I want to give you more fucking money, right? So that's one But is path. that a bit of a chicken and egg, though? Because first, for, for you to have, for a particular region to have those, yeah. those exits in entrepreneurs, yeah. you then have to have funds to invest. No, I mean, my what first company, think? I raised no money. So yeah. you could bootstrap too, right? It does help. But yes, I mean, like, that's kind of how they, So that's one yeah. path. Second path is you work for a VC, you grind it out, and, you know, 10, 15 years later, they make you a partner, maybe. Okay, that's one path. I don't like that path as much, but it happens, right? And there's some great people who do that path, but I think it's it's harder that path because you can't empathize with entrepreneurs as much because you kind of did only the VC, never actually touched building a company side. Um, but let's say you said one option where you failed an entrepreneur, but you love startups, you like kind of being part of it, right? Well, in that case, fucking hustle, scrap. And what I mean by that is not just like go around and make connections and shake fucking hands. No, what I mean is like pick a few companies. Maybe you have no money to invest, but you could invest with your time, right? You could go out there and be a great 
kind of community player, a great person in the ecosystem. And yeah, you could help, right? And so you go out there, you put your blood, sweat, tears in your heart into the company. And yeah, maybe you get some advisory shares. Or I mean, you know what? You get nothing, but you could say you were part of there. And then, you know, you kind of start building reputation. Like, oh, that person's awesome. And somehow amazing people float around them. Maybe that person's actually a better investor than they are an entrepreneur. Um, and so you could kind of build it up that way, right? Slightly longer path. But if that's, you know, th those are the cards you got dealt and you weren't lucky to make the money and, you you know, you didn't want to go down the VC route, that is one way to do it. And I have seen people go that route. I I'd say... I'm somewhere between number one and option number three. I made decent money, but I wasn't gazillionaire, right? And then also I was really well known as kind of this ecosystem person. Like I throw a lot of dinners, I did a lot of advisory work. And so those two things complement each other really well. And it made it even faster for me to raise my first fund. And um, but yeah. Uh, how tough is it to raise uh, money as a fund, right? Because always startups say, oh yeah, it's tough, you know, fundraising and it's a lot of work, but we always forget that actually funds also do yeah. fundraising, right? So, so talk a little bit. I'd say it's harder to raise a fund than it is to raise for a startup. So this is why. Yes, yeah, so you have to. Yeah, you, ha you have to get results. No, no, it's no. I mean, you have to get results of a startup or fund too, right? For sure. So with a startup, you're building a product. There's the product, and then there's you, right? And they're separated, right? So when you go out there and you pitch a startup, the VC can say that fucking sucks, right? And you as the founder be like, oh yeah, he's talking about the product. He's not talking about me. Right? But when you're VC, the product is you. I'm not building a product. I'm just saying, trust me, give me money, I'm awesome. And like, when they say, we don't want to invest in you, or that sucks, they're saying that you suck, right? And so, you can't decouple things. Two, um, when you're running a startup, there's potential momentum. You build a product, you launch it, and numbers go. So like, m one month as well, second, third, you get momentum. When you're raising a VC, once again, like, you have no product, you are the product. It's not like, oh my God, in one month I became infinitely smarter, right? No, it's like you kind of are the same person, just 12 months older. So the momentum part is not there. So in that aspect, it's hard to raise a fund. And so you have to kind of like poof out of middle air, bring something. And I suppose, and then compared to the second, so you raise the first one, you've been awesome. Raising the second one, I suppose, is harder because then you have something to already, you have a track record. And it's either well, it, it, an impressive one or it's not. It depends, right? If like we raised our second and third, well, we just announced our third fund today, $100 million. And Congratulations. Like, um, that was super e not easy, easier, right? It's because we have a great track record and we're like, yeah, we you did have this. a great track record. Yeah, right? so, so se yeah. second fund can be easier or harder, right? If you shit the bed on your first fund, you're not going to get a second fund, right? If you do really well, you'll still have to prove yourself, but it'll be easier, right? And then usually they say with VCs, if you do well in your first and second fund, you'll have five to ten funds after that. If you do bad on your first fund, or do well on your first fund, bad on your second one, you won't get a third fund, you're done. So like after the second, if you've pulled it off, then you're usually on your way. And so, um, yeah, so track record helps, or it could you know, be your death. It could be, it just stops right there. Got it, awesome. Well, let's wrap, wrap this up then on the adventurer note and kind of bringing you back to this whole world, traveling and, and so on. So where, where will we, See you in the next month, and what will you be up to in the next, you know, for, for the rest of the uh, rest of the year? Tell us something yeah, so exciting. I mean, so we just closed the fund in Asia, so now my focus will shift to Africa. Um, I've been spending a lot of time in Africa the last couple of months, but now I'll be full time in there. Um, so after this, I'll go to Hong Kong for a couple of days, um, and then I'll be in Gabon, and then potentially Nairobi after that. Um, and that's for a month out, and then that puts me somewhere in October. And I don't know, Halloween, and I'll be United States. So that's it. That's amazing. Hopefully next year again at Slash Singapore. I'm always here around this time. So yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Everybody give it up to Paul Bergil. Thank you, guys.